Hi everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today, Bolt Meter In, To Fear or Not To Fear. So we're joined together, Psychus, Micronics and Chirpy Heat today. So we work collaboratively across the industry to support housing associations, local authorities, contractors, and many others within the heat network with metering and billing. So today we have three speakers who are going to explore the metering and billing regulations, specifically the benefits of meeting the regulatory duty to install bulk meters on district networks and how this applies to the new regulations. So our expert speakers today will be Will Rao from Chirpy Heat. So Will is the director and co-founder at Chirpy Heat, an independent consultancy specializing in advising nonprofit heat network operators. Chirpy Heat's primary focus is to help heat networks achieve their low carbon, low cost and low hassle potential and resolve the headaches they have created to date in the sector. Prior to establishing Chirpy Heat in early 2019, he worked in social housing energy and sustainability for 10 years as head of sustainability in a large housing association. And in 2018, he co-founded the Heat Network, which is a best practice sharing group for heat networks in housing associations. And in 2019, he created the Heat Exchanger, which is a mentoring program to help improve skills, professionalism and learning in the heat network sector. And we also have James Cozier, who's been in the industry for 14 years with a history of electrical engineering and meter systems. And James is now the national account manager in the UK for Micronics Limited, supplying and developing products across the heat network industry. And unfortunately, Martin is unwell. So I'll be bobbing back at the end to fill in for his presentation a bit last minute. So I'm sure it'll be interesting. I'm part of the commercial team at Psychus who provide metering and billing and monitoring solutions for heat networks. So I'm going to pass you over to Will to begin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Odessa, for that, that introduction. Um, as Odessa mentioned, I'm Will Routh from Chirpy Heat, and I've got the unenviable task today of trying to make heat network regulation and compliance, uh, especially in relation to, to bulk metering, both uh, interesting and simple um, to set the scene for today's seminar. So without further ado, here we go. Um, next slide, please. Before, before that, just for those that don't know Chirpy Heat, a little bit about what we do. We were established in early 2019. We're just coming up to our two year anniversary. And our, our aim is to deliver great heat networks for housing providers, the environment, uh, and ultimately the customers and residents that live on heat networks. We do that uh, by being kind of independent and impartial advisors um, to non-profit heat network operators. So primarily housing associations and local authorities, but we also work with, with developers and anyone else in the supply chain. And we offer solutions right from the boardroom to the plant room. So that's right from any technical issues um, with the kit, right through to how do organizations want to strategically manage their heat networks, looking at uh, communications with their customers uh, and internal teams, how the finances are running, issues of, of policy and regulation like today, and then training and upskilling um, their workforce to make sure they know what they're doing with heat networks. The three co-founders of Chirpy Heat, we've got uh, 50 years client side experience for our sins. So we've all worked at housing associations and local authorities. We like to think that we're from the sector and for the sector. So we can provide solutions and services that, that solve some of the headaches and issues that we've seen to date and really make sure that he networks deliver on their kind of low carbon, low cost and low hassle potential. And then since forming, we've worked with about 25 housing associations and local authorities, um, which serve over 2000 heat networks uh, and represent about 40,000 properties, which we think is just under 10% of, of heat networks uh, in the UK at present. Okay, next slide, please. So in terms of regulation with heat networks, the main existing regulation is the heat network metering billing regulation that was introduced in 2014. And it's got four main obligations um, that it puts on to heat network providers. The first is the duty to notify to the Office of Product Safety and Standards of the existence of any heat networks. And it's using this uh, rather kind of dull and complicated looking spreadsheet on the right hand side. But every four years, heat network operators have to notify the existence of their heat networks. So the first notification was in 2015. It was repeated again last year in 2019 with the next one due in 2023. And it will be um, it's also incumbent on suppliers if they create a new heat network through a new development or a new building that has a heat network installed. They have to notify before it goes live as well. 
And then moving on from that, heat network providers need to fit meters um, to measure uh, consumption where it's appropriate to do so. So that's both individual customer meters in, in flats and apartments, and also at some building levels that we're gonna explore today. And then ongoing obligations are to ensure that the heat meters are continuously operating, that they're accurate, they're well-maintained, and they're checked for errors and calibrated to make sure they are recording what they say they're recording. And then the purpose of all that metering is to ensure that customers are billed fairly, transparently, and based on actual consumption where it's cost-effective to do so. So that leads me nicely on to the next slide, um, which is the very recent amendments um, that are hot off the press as of last week. So they were released on Friday um, afternoon. So it's um, very uh, kind of headline level. I haven't had too much of an opportunity to dive in at this point, um, but this, this is the kind of indication to date. So there's, um, it broadly splits heat networks into three main classes, which is a, is a new amendment to the regulation. So the three classes are viable heat networks where individual um, metering and billing needs to be installed. And so that is gonna be all new heat networks and any network built since 2014, except any of those that are in the exempt class that I'm gonna come on to in a minute. Second class is what's called open heat networks. And that's any existing heat network essentially that's not in the exempt class. And the third category is the exempt. And this is something that the work through, we do through the heat network and with our clients is something that we asked and lobbied for is, is that um, the exclusion of um, supported housing, student accommodation and arms houses, especially where um, there's kind of emergency accommodation where people are in and out of those buildings and individual metering does not make sense for those client groups. So we were pleased to see that's gonna be excluded from the regulations. And the other major exemption for heat networks is where there's any existing lease provision that prevents billing based on meter consumption. We know some uh, buildings have um, lease arrangements that mean it, it's very hard or impossible to install individual metering. So these are now exempt from individual metering and billing. In terms of timescales for compliance for, for heat network operators, um, in short, it's, it's not long. We've got 21 months to get our heads around this and, and meet regulation. And if heat network operators fail to do so, um, they'll be in breach uh, and there's potential for kind of unlimited fines um, if they're failing to, to meet the obligations. So the first time scale is essentially a year from when it was released on so the 27th of November, 2021. So at one year's time, the cost effectiveness tool, which the government has released and it's available on the website needs to be completed for all open category heat networks. So, that's all current existing buildings that have no meters in them on, on heat networks. And there's two versions of the cost effectiveness tool. There's the reduced cost effectiveness tool, uh, which requires information such as utility bills with consumption and the cost of the fuel going into the building. And then meter quotes for um, any metering, heat metering kit that's going to be installed into the building or would need to be installed into the building. And they all need to be there in place for the audit trail for compliance. Or there's the full cost effectiveness tool, which requires much more detailed building data to fill in that spreadsheet. Both of those tools, you input the information in and work out um, if it's cost effective to install meters. And what, what's meant by cost effective is, is the cost of installing the meters, so the cost of buying the kit and installing the kit offset by the energy savings that will be seen by the residents in the building by having access to individual consumption data. If it is a positive assessment and says, yes, it is cost effective to put in meters, uh, heat network operators then need to install those meters into those buildings by the 1st of September 2020, so 21 months away from today. So it's not long to get heads around, do those assessments, and then move on to installing meters into the buildings. And I know from experience that retrofit projects and installing meters into properties is difficult uh, and takes a lot of resource to get into those properties in the first place, the resident communication, and then actually the install process. And then it's the interesting part of the new regulations is that this is not a one-off assessment. This needs to be looked at every four years for any uh, negative assessments. So, so those that say that it's not cost effective to install individual meters. And that's to reflect that there'll be updates in metering technology, prices will come down, supply chain will gear up. Um, and ultimately it's kind of based on actually if in, people do get individual meters, they will be have access to their consumption and cost information, which can drive down energy use. 
So that's the kind of updates and we thought it'd be worth kind of including a slide on them today, but moving back towards bulk metering, which is the focus of today's um, seminar. So moving on to the next slide, this looks at the bulk metering requirements of the heat metering and billing regulations um, in relation to district heating. And district heating is kind of shown by my very crude diagram on the right hand side, but that's where you have multiple buildings that are attached to, to one heat source. So it serves many different buildings and those, some of those buildings may have multi-occupancy, so a, a block of flats, for example. And the regulations are, are relatively simple, really, in terms of district heating. Um, it requires um, building level or bulk meters to be installed in every multi-occupancy multi building. Um, so it's only the multi-occupancy buildings. So on that, that diagram, the simple crosses and ticks, if it's just a detached house, for example, it won't need a bulk level meter because it's just one property. But if it's a block of flats, it will need a bulk or building level meter. It's been as a requirement since 2014, and it's not really contingent on any prior assessment of the building for, in terms of suitability. And in terms of placement, it, it needs to be kind of placed where the district heating pipes enter the building. So at the heat exchanger or the point of where the pipes go into the building. So that's the kind of very simplistic requirement for district heating. However, there's been a number of issues of um, delivery, um, which on the next slide, please. What we found with clients in, in the social housing sector is, um, broadly speaking, there's been a, a lack of internal knowledge or resource um, in housing associations and local authorities. Heat networks are a small part of what the whole organisation does. We, we generally find it's less than 5% of their overall housing stock portfolio. And heat networks often get added on to someone else's job role, so someone in, in the heating team or the housing management team. They're not specialists and they're very busy people, so they don't have the focus and the time to look at heat network uh, management and heat network regulation. So often it, it just kind of slips through the cracks of, of um, what they need to do and when. Where clients have looked at it and they've got the resource, um, what they, they found initially is that um, what they were being offered in terms of bulk metering, it was, it was disruptive, expensive and, and quite difficult to navigate. So it was talking about cutting pipes and draining off the heat network, um, which would lead to loss of supply and heat and hot water for, for a defined period. And many heat network operators were kind of scared to go there. They, they had existing issues of customer dissatisfaction, either with reliability of supply of heat and hot water, um, issues around customer service or price of heat tariffs, for example, and people didn't want to layer on an, an additional disruption onto the top of the headaches they were experienced on those heat networks. And then in terms of the expense, um, Budget availability was quite hard, especially on newer buildings that have been built a few years prior to the regulations to say we need to go back and, and put a meter in. Um, so getting access to that budget um, became difficult, especially with, with other demands on the sector. And it also butted up against other issues of recharge. So how would this be recharged to leaseholders, for example, in, in mixed tenure buildings? And then linking it back to that lack of internal um, resource knowledge, there was a lot of information of different meters that you could use for bulk metering, different communications technologies. It was quite difficult to navigate if they didn't know what they were doing. Um, so it kind of got left on people's desks is, is how I'd say, and it didn't really lead to lots of installs of bulk meters. So from our experience, there's quite a large number of uncompliant heat networks that don't have bulk level uh, meters in place. And that's been exacerbated in that the, um, enforcement of the regulation hasn't been kind of strict and stringent, there hasn't been checks on buildings, there hasn't been um, evidence of installs requested um, by the OPSS or BAYS, um, so it's kind of hasn't, it's kind of slipped to the edge of people's desks and it hasn't led to lots of installs. So, but we expect that situation with regulation and compliance to change. The sector is moving a lot more to regulation, there's the introduction of the heat network market framework coming in the next two years, so we expect there to be a lot more focus on, on compliance within heat networks. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at communal heating. So this is where you have one building on a heat source. Um, so usually a, a boiler room in, in the basement or somewhere in the building that just serves that property. And the regulations uh, in regards to this say that it's, it's, it's not a requirement to install a bulk meter. However, there's lots of benefits to do so, um, especially when it's combined with all the individual meters uh, in that building. And it's based on the adage of if you can uh, measure it and monitor it, you can manage it. So you can start doing um, proactive management of the heat network in that building. And what we find is that the installation costs of putting in bulk metering alongside the individual metering 
uh, is easily offset by improved performance of the network. And we'd recommend that um, bulk meters are installed on communal heating, um, either at the point of any major works. So if there's any boiler replacement or plant room replacement, you put a bulk meter in at that point. And if the building is, is young, so if it's, if it's less than five years, for example, and doesn't have a bulk meter, we'd recommend that people put one in there so they can get full access and get really data rich heat networks to allow for proactive management. Which leads me on to the next slide, which is the benefits that we see um, of fully metered heat networks for heat network providers, especially those in, in the nonprofit sector. Um, if you don't have the information from the bulk meter and the individual meters, it, it doesn't give you the full visibility of the site to, to enable these things. So the first benefit would we really say is performance monitoring. You can start measuring heat distribution losses, working out where those losses in the building are and are taking place and, and then do something about them to ensure that the heat networks are delivering heat and hot water efficiently across the building. So you can see if bypasses have been left open, if particular heat interface units aren't performing as they should, and then you can um, activate um, repairs visits to ensure that the efficiency is improved and maintained. And you can also start to see the energy and carbon performance of the building. This is becoming a requirement in lots of um, planning obligations, for example, to say actually what, what is the energy and carbon performance of buildings. If you've got all the metering technology installed, uh, you can easily pull off the data and information to say actually, this is um, the carbon performance to deliver heat to the end user within that building. The second area is around improved heat network management. So I've talked about maintaining efficiency and the, the second area is around proactive repairs and maintenance. You can start to see, uh, for example, if, if there's drop offs in performance of, of the plant room, of any of the heat interface units, of the whole network as, as a whole. So, you can use that data to ask maintenance contractors to get go and service parts of the network or undertake repairs potentially before the resident notices there's any issues with heat and hot water supply. So it's a much more um, proactive service and I think this is where heat networks uh, and the data they produce can start really coming into their own and be a much better customer experience than, than individual systems that are on the market. And then the, the third point in terms of improved heat network management is, is accurate heat tariffs. 99% of the customers we work with um, do not have accurate heat tariffs. They are under recovering the costs because they don't know the distribution losses in their system. It's, they use an educated best guess, but it's not an accurate figure. It's not a live figure and it's not based on histor hist historic information. If bulk meters can go into the building, um, you can start to get accurate information to allow the heat tariff to be accurate, accurate calculated and then a full cost recovery to take place on those heat tariffs. What we see is that um, housing associations, local authorities are essentially subsidizing heating bills on heat networks because they're not recovering full costs. So we think moving towards a kind of fully data enabled network can, can resolve that problem. And then the third area of benefit is, is the monitoring and reporting. Um, you can quickly and easily see how the contractors are performing um, and when it moves from one contractor to another. So at the end of a contract or at the end of a defects period, moving to a contractor that looks after the network, you can see how it's been, the network's been performing over time, if it's been maintained to high levels of efficiency and reliability. Um, and what we generally see is um, the contractors uh, at the moment in a sector, it's starting to change, but they, they have KPIs relating to reliability and supply of heat and hot water, not to do with efficiency. So if they get a call out to say there's been a drop off in supply, they go out to sites and turn everything on and everything up, which resolves the issue of heat supply on the network. People are happy that they've got heat and hot water. However, the, it really kind of shoots the efficiency and it burns a lot more gas and electricity to provide that service. And no one ever goes back or checks on that to say, actually, has it been set to optimal settings to make sure it's running efficiently? Ultimately, that burns more, um, more energy to provide that service, which is more cost, which has to be paid for somewhere in the system. So those are kind of three main benefits that we think are fully metered networks. And what I mean by fully metered is that bulk meter combined with the individual meters. And if there's opportunity having sub meters, if there's a large building. Okay, so I think last slide, please. That's a, a very quick overshoot of um, regulation and the benefits. Um, that's everything from me for now. I think we'll be taking questions all together at the end um, from, from the three speakers. So I'm gonna hand over to James to talk about Micronics and, and their solutions for bulk metering. Thank you, Will, I appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for listening to Will and now you're getting to listen to me talk about 
metering and what we offer and how we work with Sidecost to help provide a solution to the market that hopefully ticks a lot of the boxes that Will has spoken about um, to allow metering to be done in a cost-effective and sustainable manner. Uh, next slide, please. So all I'm gonna go through today is the innovation itself, the features, the benefits, and obviously then I'll pass you on to Odessa at the end. So next slide. So the innovation itself, ultrasonic clamp on meters um, are designed to provide a alternative accurate meter for heat and water systems, ultimately reducing the cost of insulation and maintenance. These meters can be used on pipes ranging from 13 mil up to five meters with industry approved communication protocols, which allows for standalone systems or integration to existing BMSs. Uh, next slide, please. So when we look at the features of a meter itself, because we've got a, such a vast range, the main things we kind of look at is the flexibility in regards to cost on uh, pipe in sizing. So because we can range from 30 mil to five meters, um, your overall costing doesn't really change too much based on the size of that unit, uh, size of the unit. We use, all the uh, standard protocols throughout the system. So Modbus and Mbus being kind of one of the main ones used in the industry, but obviously if you want to go a bit old school, there is Pulse and we use for the 20 as well. This allows remote data collection on site. Um, this can be done via um, kind of GSM data loggers or it could be a fixed, um, wired application as well. And we offer portable and fixed units. So the fixed units are there to be as standard all the time, reading and monitoring your data. The portable unit though is a great option because what it also gives you is the ability to do a double check that the meters are working as desired. Um, they can also check against current inline meters that you're using. Um, to make sure that what they're reading is correct. And the nice thing as well, and working with Cycles on this, is it also gives them the option of ensuring that when they are doing their surveys, that if there is a area where metering could be difficult, it allows them to be able to test that prior to um, install to ensure that when they when they go to install that meter that it is going to work and prove that the technology works. Liquid wise, I mean obviously for district heating it's going to be it's going to be warm water, it's going to be water, but we can also do everything from viscous liquids as well and everything in between that. Most of our accuracies are plus or minus one to three percent. Um, one percent is going to be on an ideal install. 3% would be when there's uh, factors involved that potentially create turbulence within a pipe, um, i.e. installing close to a pipe uh, turn, um, and that's gonna cause some potential turbulence. But the meter itself has clever enough technology in there that understands that the, those things happen within pipe runs, hence why we have that ability to kind of say one to 3%. Really for retrofit is, is absolutely perfect. Um, no downtime, no drainage, no cutting off a of supply, no reduction of heat uh, can be installed on a live system. And actually even on new build applications, when you're looking at designing um, new systems going forward, instead of looking at things like having to have breaks within pipe runs, the design could be if we put a pipe to here to here, and technically we can meter across that pipe run at almost any point. The technology itself was designed originally by Micronix almost 35 years ago now. Um, they were one of the first um, companies in the market to design ultrasonic metering and non-invasive metering. Um, and they have gone through the ups and downs of obviously technology issues when they first came out, which Historically, we understood and knew that there was um, issues with 
accuracy in reading to where we're at now, which is partnering with companies like Sarcos who have ultimate confidence um, that our meters are accurate and flexible for their applications and for the clients. We offer a five year warranty on all our fixed meters. And as I've said, they are fully non-invasive and non-intrusive. So there'd be no cutting into pipes whatsoever. Next slide, please. So just kind of independent validation. So as I said, we've been, we've been around for 35 years and we've been installing solutions with thousands of clients. And some of the main clients we've worked with in the past, uh, Heathrow Airport, where we've um, put meters into their new terminals. Um, the actual itself was based on a new install. So all they did with their consultants is actually design it with straight runner pipes and then indicated where they wanted the meter, um, which for them made their design process very, very easy. And um, we do a lot of work with Santander in their major data centers for your banking. Uh, Manchester University, we've done projects with them over the years for their student accommodation. And obviously with Sarcos as being one of our main partners, uh, working with you know, local authorities in monitoring and being able to understand what's happening with their systems. Uh, we're also members of UKDA and ESTA. And really the way we look at the meter itself is it's a solution that can be implemented anywhere within the marketplace, commercial industrial marketplace that has water heat requirements. Um, and it can be monitored um, you know, remotely or within house and looking to expand. And it's really for companies that are looking to expand or just improve their energy management infrastructure. The technology is fit and manufactured and designed within the UK. Um, but we also are a global and European distributor um, as well for, you know, for other countries. And then recently, one of the, one of the largest projects we're currently involved with and looking at is with Thames Valley Police at their main training centre near Reading. Um, they're looking to upgrade their monitoring systems uh, for that training centre, which involves several buildings, and they're taking it to a extra level where they want to actually monitor not only the uh, building as a whole, but each individual floor. And the idea behind that for them was because they've got um, staff members that only work certain times of the week within the training centre or on certain floors, they want to understand whether or not they need to move their staff around um, and been able to understand what their energy usage and what they can save. Now, the energy manager alone has looked at this and obviously without being able to prove the data with a monitoring system in place, he thinks he can save up to 17% of his energy usage just by understanding the profiles and making changes um, that are gonna save energy cost. Next slide, please. So as I said, benefits really are the accuracy of the meter is between one and three percent. Um, this is this is pretty standard within the industry as a whole. Um, and when you're monitoring from a submetering level, that is that would be very accurate for what you need. Um, obviously, reducing installation and component cost. Now, when you start to get over two inches on uh, water meters, especially and flow metering. Um, the need is on any design is flanges and bypasses. Now with our meter that's there, um, when you're doing that design, you don't need to have those in um, because again, there's no shutting down of a system or there's no needing to bypass a system to replace the meter. Um, it goes onto the pipe directly and for that case, there is no additional cost required for that. Retro systems as well. When you know, when you're looking at it, people only look at the price of the unit. Really, it's also looking at whether or not we can a put no downtime, but also look at whether or not we can save costs in other ways. And one of the big ways is water does cost money, 
So if you're draining the system, it's going to cost you money. And if you're filling that system up, it's going to cost you money. And then the other side of it is, and this has been spoken about before, is looking at, you know, freezing the pipes. Now, liquid nitrogen uh, as a cost is quite expensive. And for most people, when you buy of a certain size, they need a license for it. So it's not a cheap option either. Um, our meter can battle with Modbus and Emma systems, which we read remotely through a BMS system and can be linked to larger solutions allowing for alarms and flow switches as well. Next one, please. This here is just a bit of a cost that was done. It was done a few years ago and it was done by Bar Spoons with a independent um, energy consultant and design. And what he looked at was the cost of um, putting an inline meter in against a, um, a, a, a basically a non-invasive unit. And what it kind of shows is the cost of a non-invasive based on any size pipe doesn't really change. Um, because the there's no cutting, there's no need for flanges, the actual cost of the materials doesn't change. The cost itself is always going to be flat line, whereas what, it sh what he was able to show through it, um, looking at the costing involved, that the bigger the meter get, it almost exponentially in the end kind of just picked up in price. And it just shows that the, the bigger the meter, especially over, you know, it's kind of two inches, it's, it's a, the cost itself doesn't kind of weigh up on what's, you know, what we've been told historically through the industry. Next slide, please. So that's me done. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I appreciate it's metering and it's not the most interesting, but hopefully I've piqued some questions and kind of maybe some interest in, you know, what else we can do. Um, I'm going to now pass you on to Odessa um, and she's going to talk you through how that all works together with Cyprus. Thank you, James, and thank you, Will. Um, yeah, so we've really seen a lot about um, why, why we need to do it and how um, or what we can use to do it. So now I'm just going to move on about and focus more on how we do the installation and how we monitor the bulk meters going forwards. Um, so next slide, please. So the first step for bulk metering is ensuring we survey. So this is the best opportunity to make sure we fully understand the requirements for the bulk meter installation. Um, and that includes the best location um, to make sure that, the, that we are providing a ro robust solution, which is future proof. So we take into consideration current and preempted regulations to ensure that the installation is at the level of industry best practice. Next slide, please. So the installation of a clamp meet on meter, like um, James has mentioned, is the least invasive solution to be able to monitor energy on a block level. A clamp on meter sits on the pipe work, so there's no need to cut into the um, pipe and therefore reduces the need to drain or isolate the system, which of course affects the residents in their access to their heat. Um, and this has been part of the metering and billing regulations since 2014. And the solution offers a quick and efficient installation, but it's also easy to move the location if it would be needed to in the future. Next slide, please. The simplicity of these meters also means that maintenance is simple. We recommend visiting these meters annually. It's a good opportunity to make sure they haven't been tampered with, they're sending the data accurately, um, and it's also an opportunity to reapply any grease or heat compound in line with man manufacturer requirements. So we've rolled out um, bulk meter projects for about 350 installs for compliance, including um, projects with LNQ and Camden Council. And we predominantly use the MBUS communication. This is because we get more information by MBUS than we would with um, like outdated pulse communications. Pulse can typically be unreliable and we only get really consumption information. Whereas on MBUS systems, we can get the flow temperatures, the return temperatures, um, and have more information about the system in general. Um, next slide, please. So here are um, some pictures of an installation at Camden. So you can see in the first picture, it's a clamp on meter, just sat on the pipework there. And then in the second, meter, uh, second picture, you can see that that's connected to a calculator and a data collection unit, which is really important to be able to monitor the meters remotely. And then in the third picture, the jacket just 
to remove or prevent any unnecessary heat loss. Next slide, please. So the regulations ask us to install a meter, but we see it as an opportunity for monitoring rather than just ticking a box. So using a data collection system for remote data ensures you can monitor the network and block efficiency and monitor any system changes. So the data can also be used to um, be used for tariff management and having it all remotely removes any need to actually physically visit the site. So there's that cost saving there for ongoing monitoring and maintenance as well. Next slide, please. So it's really important to use open protocol equipment to monitor the data, just making sure that you're not locked to any service provider and you can move to multiple data retrieval companies if you needed to. So Cycus will only provide open protocol equipment for this reason. It's also really important to use two-way communication. It improves that remote monitoring um, experience because it not only can the data logger then send information to us, but we can also communicate with the data logger for changing any settings. So for, for when we install a bulk meter, as standard, we would put that on as half hourly data. But um, in certain situations, and we've had a few clients who need to monitor the data um, closely, just for a short period of time, so they would request maybe five minutely data. So we can um, amend all of those settings remotely without actually having to physically um, visit site. So it just reduces the cost and improves the ongoing usage of the system. Next slide, please. So IoT stands for Internet of Things, and it's the new technology that we're seeing, really. And um, so you can see on the graph there that there's the um, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 4G, MBOS, everything we're very familiar with currently. And then you've got the IoT, which sits further along in the range. It has a better signal range um, and it's just better, more improved communication technology. So as you can see by the statement on the screen, um, that is expected to be, um, a, a lot of these systems are expected to be in installed by 2025. So we see this as the next communication. Uh, next slide, please. So LoRaWAN is an IoT system. It provides wireless communication at a longer range. Um, then the current wireless system, so reducing the requirement for repeaters, and it's therefore just a bit more cost effective. So LoRaWAN can be used um, for other systems as, as well, not just metering. So um, usually there's really minimal signal in car parks, but LoRaWAN has been successful in monitoring car parking spaces and where they're available. Um, even for emergency service car parking spaces, if they've been blocked for whatever reason, it can be all monitored remotely. Across Europe also, we can monitor temperature and hum humidity sensors, door sensors, and even rubbish bins. So visiting a rubbish bin to empty them when they're actually full instead of um, a wasted trip to a bin that's barely been used. Um, next slide, please. And SciCus monitor all of this data through MabDeck, which stands for Metering and Billing Dashboard. Uh, it's an in-house designed and developed um, software uh, that has numerous features, but one of the main features that is really relevant to bulk metering, metering is the report. So um, you can run various reports, including meter reading, consumption, flow and return temperature reports, as well as bespoke reports that can be set up. So they, they can be run automatically on a regular basis and just sent to an email. So it means that you can really monitor the system that you have. MabDeck means that you're not just installing a meter and forgetting about it. It allows us to use that data we have available from the system, react where necessary, and it means that the residents who receive heat from the system can do so with confidence. Thank you. So I think that's everything from me, James, and Will, but I notice we do have um, a lot of questions coming through. So um, I'll put these some of these questions have already been answered in the chat, I believe. So I put some questions out to, um, let's go with this one. So to either of you, James and Will, um, it says, well, would installing a bulk meter within the commercial gas boiler house meet these needs rather than installing a bulk meter to all blocks of flats? I think that's for you, Will. Sure, I'll take that one. Um, so I think I did answer this on a, on a separate thread, but um, if uh, each building on a district heating network will need a bulk level or building level meter, um, we'd also recommend that one goes into the plant room or um, 
gas gas room so that you can measure distribution losses from the plant room to each of those buildings and if anything comes up on there then you can identify that quickly and easily um, someone also asked about actually what if there's um, different cores within a building um, for example in a block of flats that have multiple cores um, the the guidance we've had on that is if if uh, each of the cores has a separate pipe run back to uh, the energy center or plant room um, they will need an individual meter on that that core as well. Um, so it's a little bit of confusion because they could all be within the same building, but they count as um, separate in terms of regulations. And um, we've come across that scenario before. The other thing as well, well just as a thought, um, is a building that is one, but you cannot access the full building from one side to the other. And then, then it would be technically classed as two buildings then, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, that's another one that always pops up as well. So it, it's sometimes a case that, yes, it looks like one building, but if it's got multiple entrance and there is a dividing wall that you cannot then go from one side to the other, that would have to be classed as two buildings. Is that correct still? I believe so, yeah. He, he, yeah, that's as far as I know. It's, um, yeah. I think Hamish made the point in the chat that um, buildings come in all shapes and sizes and there's, it's um, as much as the regulators try to cater for everything, there's, there'll always be kind of grey areas and different types of buildings that come, come along, but I think they're, they're the main two that I've seen as well. Yeah. Well, so there's another question here. I think this one's for you, James. Um, you mentioned a bit about warranty. So there's a question about the actual lifetime of the heat meters. Yeah. You know, if there was any guidance or what you would recommend for the amount of time before you replace them? Um, the meter itself should last for up to 15 years before it needs to be fully replaced. Um, the only thing we would always look at in regards to maintenance and obviously having it checked regularly, I would say almost every 12 months, as what Odessa has said before, is um, sensors and obviously connection to the pipe itself. So in regards to um, if the pipe work is on the hotter side, it could potentially damage the sensors in the long run. Um, however, it's always cheaper to replace a sensor than it is to replace an entire meter. And that will be picked up, i.e. when it's being monitored, um, the fact that there would be some potential loss of reading. Um, and that's something that's obviously when you're being, you know, using your proactive maintenance and look data, um, then it will, it will pick up any errors. But yeah, the meter itself and technically the sensors as well should last for up to 15 years um, without any major issues. Uh, Brill, and this one is probably for you, Will. So um, what are the main challenges for heat network operators in terms of installing bulk or building level meters? Oh, um, lots of challenges. I think, uh, well, part of the reason we're running today is almost like knowing where to start, um, kind of saying, actually, how do we uh, do this? Um, so hopefully today has been useful from that point. I, I would say it's kind of um, demystifying it, really saying, actually, um, what's it cost and looking at some real life case studies. So I, it's, it's really good to see the examples you provided with Ellen Q and Camden who um, are kind of really on top of the bulk metering requirements. Um, so I think seeing that it can be done and understanding what the cost is per, per, for a kind of simple network so they can then multiply that up across their stock. Um, and I know it's budget setting time at quite a lot of these organizations at the moment, they're looking for a next year's budget. So I think it'd be a great time to say, actually, we've got uh, five networks that need some bulk meters put in. What, how much would the, those bulk meters be? Um, and I'm, sh I'm kind of sure Cycles would be happy to provide an indicative quote that then could be put into next year's budget because we know it's not easy often to get budget straight away. But um, yeah, get the budget, get a quote. Um, and um, I'd say keep life simple, which is we'd, we'd say clamp on meters um, and remove that disruption are a cheaper alternative as well. So hopefully, uh, yeah, this is all part of the solution, but that's kind of the next steps I'd say is, is get an indicative quote and put it into the budget and um, then take it from there. Brilliant. There's, um, this one's probably for you, James. So um, it's a little bit of asking a bit of information about the U1000 heat meter. So yeah. somebody has put in about that it needs a certain amount of pipe distance on either side of the meter um, and that it can be restrictive, I think, when installing the smaller plant rooms. So 
just wondered if you had a thought on that or how you can work around that. Yeah, so we, we would always say an ideal perfect install would be 10 times the diameter on the flow side and five times the diameter on the return side. And as the question has stated, that is not always the case. So the reason obviously we know that what we have done with the meters as a whole is we allow for a level of dampening within the readings that are taken in by those meters. So the meter itself will collect all the data that's needed, but what it will actually show and what you can then do with a meter is program it to almost ignore um, some of the extremes that have come out from um, the data itself. So what you can then do with that is you can say, right, let's, let's take out the top 10% of those data and the bottom 10%. And what it would do is it's almost narrowing the field. So it's still using the time of flight technology to be able to understand what your flow rate is based on a sensor hitting a sensor, but it's going to take out the extremes. And what that means then is on tighter installs, it allows them to be installed with maintaining the accuracy levels that are required to be sub meters and use the data correctly for um basically maintenance and understanding what's happening with your network i just i'd add to that is um probably links that question to previously is, is really um i think when organizations are, are kind of specifying it's really understanding what data they want uh, in terms of what do they want that they could data to, uh, meters provide data on different uh, granularity different regularity and for all sorts of things so i think it's important that um has providers understand what they want and what they're going to do with that data in terms of that management so making sure that's built into their specification up front because um there's no point specifying the the fanciest meter that provides data every every three seconds uh, if they're not going to use it really so what are they going to use the data out there um, that comes out of it for um so yeah understand that before specifying as well yeah i agree with that and you worked for a housing association for quite some time, Will. Did you um, come across bulk metering during that time? Was it useful to you? Or if you could have made it any a better situation, what would that have looked like? Um, yeah, good question. It, uh, I did. I, I did a couple of retrofits. I think it was about 2016. I did some retrofits um, onto um, heat networks that didn't have bulk meters. Um, and I think what I found was that we got the individual metering data from our metering and billing provider. Um, and then we got the bulk meter data through a different source. Um, and in kind of the practicalities of my job, I didn't have the time to kind of delve into those data sources to say, actually, how is that whole network performing? Um, kind of because there's lots of rich data coming into my inbox. So I just didn't have the time to do anything with it. And I'm sure I could have used it to say, actually, it's not running efficiently. Um, where could have improvements been made? Which customers are high and low performers? All of those kind of good things that can, can be done on heat wet network. So it's something I say, actually putting all that data together in one place in a, in a very usable format. Because um, I think the scenario I described is probably quite replicated across the sector. People don't have much time to delve into data, even if they wanted to. You're not data's not everyone's cup of tea, but for those that is, they still probably don't have time. So um, it's something that we're we're looking at as Chirpy Heat, and I know others are as well, is saying actually, how can we turn that data into action um, to make heat networks kind of perform really well? So on the, the repairs and maintenance side, on the efficiency side, on the giving customers a great experience side. So that's something that yeah I, I've seen coming in and um, there's lots of platforms and dashboards being released at the moment. Um, and then creating that to, to action is something we're looking at is, is how can organizations set, put all that data and say, go straight through to their con repairs contractors, kind of automatically raises visits or automatically raises support visits for vulnerable customers, for example. So it's, uh, yeah, it's one of the, the great things about heat networks is their data. And I think the next challenge for the sector is making really good use of that data. I think, I think part of it as well, Will, is for me is when I've spoken to clients in the past, it's a bigger part of it is understanding um, how much they are using and what they're getting back out of that as well, um, which makes them, which show, can show a very clear picture of how efficient or even inefficient a system is. And then from that, being able to determine whether or not that is a inefficiency at the border itself, or is it the fact there's, there's quite a lot of losses across the communal areas within the buildings and the pipe runs. Um, 
and what can be done to improve that. And then maybe the other side of it, if you go down to the billing side of it, is changing the habits of residents and how they use their heat as well. Um, and they're all things that once you have that understanding, for me, you can make informed and beneficial solutions to make that system more effective and more cost effective for your for your residents. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I, I remember the um the good old days of I used to dread it, the kind of tariff reviews at each year. Um price was one side, but working out the efficiency of the the, the whole building was another and it took a lot of data, manual crunching of spreadsheets and marrying it all together and saying, oh, what's the efficiency of the network been last year? And I, I think that could all be sped up and actually could very quickly, if you can put the systems in place, say actually the, the heat network's live performance is this and it's, it's seasonal and annual performance is this. And that's the information you need for the tariffs. So rather than having to have that dread and do those two or three days of number crunching, you, you should be able to pull it off pretty instantly and say the tariff needs to go up or down um, accordingly. So I think... Yeah, it's, um, I think it can solve a lot of headaches and, and time for people that uh, heat networks um, are part of their job. Yeah. So there's another question that's come in, <clears throat> um, whether the customer has access to data software and what other costs to use it. So I think this one's more to do with MADDEC. So I'll answer it um, from the, it depends on what the, um, who you're referring to as the customer. So. As the client in terms of reporting, yes, absolutely, they have access to software. Now, if you wanted to use reporting, and so obviously having access to the um, bulk meter information, but if you were monitoring these individual residents and apartments, then that's a different, it's still MabDEC, it's just another level to MabDEC where you can use um, resident monitoring and billing, which then all customers would have their own portal to access their own data from. But I do wonder whether, um, what James and Will think to you, <clears throat> all, all residents or have everyone having access to that bulk energy information or the um, system efficiency information, if there was any benefits to everyone being aware of that. Yeah, I think I think that's a bit of a, I think that's quite a tough one because I mean, I'm guilty of myself in my own property where really I just want to pay my bill and I can use what I want. However, we need to be obviously realistic as well that a lot of these district heating systems are in low poverty areas in my historical kind of view on it and knowledge. Um, it's probably more important they understand their own usage, but I think regarding the efficiencies and how the bulk meters are viewing what's being lost across the system and how well it's working, I would say that's more for the end client and then that would be something they could report to their residents at say a yearly residential meeting because obviously when those tariffs are reviewed and if there is a price increase or a price decrease um, I, as a resident I'd want to know why and understand what's going to be done to improve that efficiency if it can be improved that's going to help reduce my my energy cost yeah I'd totally agree with all of that and um it's something that um regulation is is going to push is transparency um of pricing and how heat tariffs are calculated and it, it's something that we always advocate is um is for any heat network operator to say this is how we calculate a tariff so what's what's the price of gas going in and what's the efficiency of the building and we know that can be quite a scary um kind of experience because if you're reporting low efficiencies on a building it will inevitably raise questions like James said is, is why is it low efficiency because my bills go up. Um, but I think without that transparency and visibility to data, nobody can do anything about it really. The, the heat network operator can't make um, interventions to improve the efficiency. Um, and then customers are a little bit in the dark to kind of why their tariffs are the way they are. So we totally support the transparency of, of data. And I agree with James's point on a day-to-day -day basis, um, residents and customers very few of them will look at the efficiency um, I think it, it I'd agree it'd be a once a year reporting that people can access somehow but I, I don't think they need kind of complete visibility um, of real-time monitoring I think that's probably more for the people that look after the heat network um, in terms of their management. But having said that though as well is if a resident was particularly interested I would see no harm in them individually having that discussion and being told 
because I think, again, it goes back to that transparency level of saying, well, actually, we monitor, we know what it's doing, you know, we know that there are improvements to be made. Um, so why hide behind that as well? And that yeah. I think that also brings into a level of ownership and, you know, there's a responsibility there to the residents, for me anyway, to ensure that they have the best tariff that we can offer them, you know, from a from a uh, housing association and local authority based on how well their system works. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think it'd be great. Yeah, I think it'd be great if they could log onto their portal and it had their costs and it just somewhere it had the efficiency and they could look at it if they want to and um, understand it. Yeah, so yeah, definitely don't hide hide behind it. Well, and there's another question here about um, the accuracy of the meters and how you could verify if a bulk, bulk meter is reading correctly. Okay, so initially what we always offer of all our bulk meters and um, a minimum is a test certificate when it leaves the manufacturing uh, to say what accuracy it's currently running at, which is always going to be between that one and three percent. Um, what we also do with that as well is we can offer or with working with Sarcos is they can then show and do a calibration on that meter at any point um, and they can then produce a calibration certificate to show the current level of accuracy on that as well. Um, what was the second part of that, Odessa? Sorry, I forgot now. Um, so it was the accuracy of the bulk meters and how you could verify the bulk meters reading correctly. Yeah, and then to also verify as well, because we offer portable uh, units as well, um, Sarcross have a portable unit, and what they're able to do is, and they can do this as part of the agreement with yourselves, is they could go and actually put a portable unit um, directly next to or as near to a current bulk meter as possible, and that will be able to show a reflection of what the portable meter is reading compared to the bulk meter um, and again with that level you know again the portable meter has a one percent accuracy um, so as long as it's within that one percent we know that the bulk meter is reading within the test certificate or calibration certificate parameters that were stated uh, that's brilliant i'm just trying to um fit in one more, I'm just conscious of time. So this yeah. question drifts ever so slightly away from bulk metering, but it's still metering. So the question is, can leaseholders within a social housing block refuse to have a heat meter installed within their dwelling? Well, as in, by the, res as in the residents themselves? Yeah, so I think this might be um, a little bit of for Will, I'm not 100% certain, but I'd be interested in your thoughts as well, James. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, sorry, Will. Sorry, Will, you go first. So, I, I, it all comes down to the lease because there's um, there's not a kind of standard lease for leaseholders. We've seen most leases don't have much references to it. So, the heat network operator can can enforce the installation of a heat meter. Some leases have some clauses that um, mean that leaseholders can get around it and say, no, we don't want it. Um, it's um, quite a hard argument for a leaseholder to win saying they shouldn't have individual metering and billing. I'd say from, a, from our experience, most leases allow the heat network operator to install them. Um, and in terms of what, they're try what a leaseholder is um, trying to do, I, yeah, it's quite an e a relatively easy mm. argument to win. But it, I think a lot of it depends on access because if you need to put the heat meter inside the unit, that makes things a little bit difficult because then you have to go down enforce enforcement of lease conditions to say, actually, we need to get access. Um, to put it onto the HRU, for example, which may be in, inside the dwelling, uh, which obviously creates a physical barrier. So um, I'd say it's quite hard for leaseholders to refuse, but we know in practical, they, well, I've seen um, leaseholders that do in practical, practical terms refuse. So it's, it's not always easy. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think for, for my side of it is generally if it's a lease and the lease is owned and the property is actually owned by the local authority, um, in general, they there might be a little bit of objection, but doing resident doing resident kind of committee meetings and actually going through the potential the benefit of monitoring and metering correctly, even from a residential and bulk metering standpoint, so they understand why it's happening. Um, you tend to find that objection is kind of 
uh, eased a little bit. Um, I've had more problems when um, people have actually owned their own properties with inside a block of flats. Um, so they actually own the property, they, they have a mortgage or paid the mortgage. Um, and because at that point then I don't, well, the, the issues I've seen in the past is the council can't really tell them to have a meet at that point because it's basically their own house. Um, it, even it, though it has been offered that the council will pay for that meter to go in for them. Um, it often, that's always been yeah. an objection I've seen and that's always been quite difficult to get around that. Yeah, it often comes down to demarcation and demise of the heat interface unit because um, if it's with the property owner or with the heat network operator and there's real variation in the set and we generally advise it, it stays with the heat network operator even yeah, if it's yeah. inside the flat because for example, for exactly this purpose, you can install metery on the HIU then because it's part of the heat network heat network operators kit, um, and also the, the performance of the heat interface unit affects the whole network. So we think it should be treated as part of the whole network rather than something individual to that flat. So it's something that we, but we have seen um, leases that uh, demise it to the individual um, property owner, which creates headaches and difficulties of this nature. But I, was, I mean, I, I'd say if there's any. If the idea or the, that thought is put out and there is going to, you feel there is going to be any objection, I would, I would probably arrange a, a residential meeting um, and try and have those discussions and kind of voice, have those kind of concerns voiced because, I mean, I can't speak for Odessa, but I know that I've done it in the past and I, I'd always be happy to do it again, um, you know, to support clients and Sarkos in regards to helping residents understand why they want we're making these changes and actually the positives it will have on their well hopefully reducing their bills because even though they have a set amount it potentially could be just a set cost every month um one of the key things out of it is you know can we reduce their bills by understanding the network from a bulk meter standpoint but then with that that will then affect the tariff and then if they understand the pain for what they use, hopefully it'll change that mentality of, well, I don't need to have my radiators on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because I'm only being charged one cost. Um, and once they kind of understand that and probably see that benefit, I think that makes a big difference to their objections as to why meters should be going in. Yeah, that's brilliant. Well, thank you very much, James and Will. And thank you for everyone who has um, popped in a question and spent the time listening. So if we haven't answered your question, we will contact you with an answer and we'll organise sending them around. But thank you very much. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Appreciate you attending. Thank you.